our second installment of Small Boats Big Science. Um, we've been thinking a lot in the office about how do we engage you all, folks in our community, with some of the issues <coughs> that aren't just unique to fisheries, but that fishermen and people on the water deal with probably more frequently and that have a bigger impact on their lives than perhaps yours, but nonetheless that are impacting you as well. And part of your broader community is a scientific community, folks that are passionate about understanding what's going on in the marine environment, either offshore or inshore, and the roles that uh, those environments play in your day-to-day -day lives. And so, you know, we're blessed with a very deep, uh, knowledgeable community down in Woods Hole, but also here uh, on the East Coast. In fact, tonight we actually reached all the way down to Florida to bring somebody up to talk to you. And uh, I'm not going to go into any more detail, but to just say thank you for being here. Um, we hope this becomes a permanent uh, program here at the Alliance. You being here helps me to believe it can be. And uh, I hope you have a good time. The intention here is for it to be very interactive. So please do raise your hands, ask questions. Um, and again, thank you. I'll turn it over to Rachel Burrell. cities coming in with your registration and we, we have a lot of Chatham right who, who lives in Chatham here yeah yeah a few of us I think there is a Harwich yeah too yeah a few more um, I think I saw someone coming from McLean is that person here no or, or even a Boyden Beach I saw on the list as well yeah yeah oh back there all right welcome yeah great to have you with us um, I traveled up here too I, I was coming from North Carolina I flew in today um, I'm in grad school out there um, I had the amazing opportunity to be up here for the summer, uh, for my summer internship. Um, I'm in a master's program, so I had to go back down and uh, was just absolutely elated to have the invite to be able to come back up and, and help be a part of this event. Um, this is just an amazing organization, right? Um, who of you have been to an event here before? Yeah. Yeah, if you, isn't it just an incredible place to be? Absolutely. I was blown away by my internship experience up here and just seeing how just a, a small little organization could just have such far-reaching impacts. Um, and that's across the board. At, at, my, at my school where I'm at now, down North Carolina, people know this organization, um, and not just because we have, have graduates from the program working here as well, um, but even John's name has come up. Um, some of our law professors down there have, have brought him up in classes as an example of um, you know, what one person can do and, and um, pulling together a community. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> being leadership and, and getting a community together to advocate for local fishermen as well as the environment all in one. Um, so really excited that, that I get to be here personally and really excited to share this experience with all of you here and um, hope this is going to be a really great evening. Um, so as John mentioned, this is the second one in our event of our uh, Small Boats Big Science series. Uh, were any of you at the first event we had in August? Yeah, great. So you guys are ready for the pop quiz we're going to have about it? <laughs> no, no, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the wonderful thing about this series is that each one is, is, their own, is their own show. You don't have to have come to the previous ones to be able to get just as much out of the next ones. Um, but I think you'll find we're going to have more of these in the series. And the more of them you go to, the more you're going to be able to pull out of the series, being able to connect the dots between our different topics, and just seeing how we're all connected to our local environment, how the different facets of our environment are connected to one another and how it's all connected to our fishing communities here as well. Um, so I'm really excited that, that this one is going to be focused really on our, our local ecosystems, marine ecology, um, concepts that we're really excited to share with you and that we're so excited we have such incredible guest speakers here to share with you as well. Um, it's going to be a really fun event, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start being able to turn, it, turn it over to the speakers who you're here to see today um, to hear from them. Um, our first one is uh, Jill here, who I'll, I'll read her bio in a second as well, so you know her, her full, very impressive background. But um, I was introduced to Jill this summer, um, and from our first call, I was just astounded by not just how, how smart she is and her intelligence and science background, 
but how she has a real passion for making science accessible to everyone, uh, making sure that it's equitable, and that people who care about it, such as all of you, uh, can be involved in the process and, and learn a little bit more. Um, so with that, don't mind me as I <laughs> pick up my papers down here. <laughs> um, and let me just tell you a little bit about Jill. Um, so Jill Thompson Grimm is a PhD student at the University of South Florida College of Marine Science in St. Petersburg, Florida. We have another Floridian in the house as well. <laughs> um, and she is a Knight Research Fellow for Marine Science. Before starting her PhD, she worked with Texas Parks and Wildlife's Artificial Reefing Program, where she helped decommission oil rigs to create fish habitats in the Gulf of Mexico. She completed her Master of Science at the Hart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies, where she worked on the Great Red Snapper Count Project, a $12 million project aimed at estimating the absolute abundance of red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm. Her research interests revolve around answering critical questions about how commercially and recreationally important fishes in the Gulf of Mexico use their habitats and how these species and their habitat interactions are impacted by climate variability, overfishing, and invasive species. Um, and with that, please give a warm welcome to Jill. <laughs> Thank you guys, and thank you for having me. Thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, as she said, I'm Jill Thompson Grimm, and I'm really excited to be here today. I came up from Florida, um, so in case anyone was curious, I was an hour north of where the hurricane hit. Um, I got really lucky. Um, but today, I'm gonna talk to you guys about ecology and how it connects us. And then, when, in fact, I'm actually gonna tie it back into hurricanes, and I was already planning this prior to the hurricane hitting us. Um, so before we jump into this concept of how ecology connects us all, I first want to just define like what is ecology? And simply put, it's just, it's how organisms interact with each other and with their physical environment. So that seems simple, right? But at the same time you think about it, it's every interaction and every way that things are connected. So when you're an ecologist, it's such a big realm so you can ask all different types of questions, and this can range from asking questions about populations. And like Rachel said in my introduction was like, one question I've asked or was part of a group that asked was, um, how many red snapper are in the Gulf of Mexico? So that's what we did. You could ask how many Atlantic cod are in Cape Cod? Um, I do wanna take a brief second. As I said earlier, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand, sh shout them out, let's make this interactive. Um, it's more fun for me too. So, um, okay, you can ask questions about populations. You can also ask questions about communities and wondering like, what's the diversity in this community? So how do these species interact? Do Atlantic cod interact well with bluefish or what's the diversity there? You can also ask questions about like habitat interactions because some species do really well in rocky habitats and not very well in sandy habitats. Why? That's what ecologists ask. And then one that's near and dear to my heart is climate impacts. So what, how are these fish interacting with their physical environment? As these waters are warming, how are bluefin tuna reacting? I mean, how many people in this room like to catch bluefin tuna? I do. So like, how is that gonna change? So these are the, some of the ideas of ecology. But I mean, I have, don't have enough time here to tell you everything about ecology, so these are just some facets. Um, also, it's super dynamic because it's the idea of interactions, right? So if one thing changes, how does everything else respond to those changes? Um, one way that you can evaluate some interactions is looking at trophic dynamics. So that's kind of a weird word, trophic dynamics, right? It basically just means how does energy move through a system? One second, there's a cord here. Um, so if, how energy moves through a system? What is energy though? I mean, sometimes people talk about like good vibes, good energy, but no, we're talking about food. How does food move through a system? So you could think of like a food chain, right? And you can look at a diet. And so you have phytoplankton at the bottom. This picture here, you'll see it a bunch. This is phytoplankton. And you have krill and how Krill eat the phytoplankton and the upper level consumers eat everything below it. And so food chains are really cool because they're simple, right? One to one to one. But that's not really what we deal with. <laughs> it's more like this. 
Okay, because everything's interacting, right? So you have a lot of things eating the phytoplankton, but a lot of things also um, eating what eats the phytoplankton. And a cool thing about these models that are more realistic is that they include fishermen because we have to consider fishing pressure because they're also eating or eating or taking out our top level consumers. Um, so one thing about some of these models that you'll see is that they assume a steady state. So when you see a food web, it's like, this is what happens under normal conditions. Unfortunately, we live in a world where we don't always have normal conditions. So there are two, there are two ways that you can really alter a food web. But we're gonna just go back to the food chain concept because I think giving you guys a giant food web for every single scenario is just like a bit overwhelming. So um, we'll just, we're gonna look at this food chain. Um, and so two of our controls are either top down or bottom up. So a top down control is a, when consumer controls the community structure. So in this situation we have phytoplankton which are eaten by krill those uh, krill are eaten by Boston mackerel, and the Boston mackerel are eaten by bluefin tuna. And so we have two situations. One, we remove the top level consumers, or we decrease their population a lot, okay? You fish a ton, you take a lot of bluefin tuna out, now you have less top level consumers. So you decrease their biomass and their predation pressure on those um, Boston mackerel, right? So now you have a ton of Boston mackerel, possibly, because no one's really eating them. Good for the Boston mackerel. But those Boston mackerel eat krill, so you have a decrease in krill, right? And this is a trophic cascade, when something at the top influences all the way down to the bottom. Um, we could also have the opposite situation where we increase our bluefin tuna. Kind of like that, maybe. But now we decrease our boss and mackerel and decrease that grazing on krill, you know, the opposite situation. But you may ask, well, how, how do we get more bluefin? That sounds cool. Well, there's a lot of ways. But one way that you can consider, and that I consider a lot since I do work in the Gulf of Mexico where hurricanes are really common, um, one in particular that I'm gonna talk about today, Hurricane Katrina, is what happens when you have a hurricane hit and you almost have a complete reduction or 95% reduction of your fishing industry. Because this is talking about more than just your ships being taken out. What about your processing plants? What about your workers who no longer have homes that have to leave? So if you go back and you think about Hurricane Katrina, if you guys remember, that was a Category 5 storm hit um, New Orleans, and they lost about 95% of their fishing fleet. It took them years to recover but because they lost ships, they lost um, processing plants, they lost workers, and those workers, a lot of them never came back. So it's not a short response. It's a very long time to come back from that. Um, this is just one example. So on a happier note, we can have bottom-up controls. And bottom-up controls are kind of interesting because these are when the physical and the chemical things going on are influencing community structure. So before it was those predators, now it's almost like the environment. And so when I say physical, I just mean something like temperature. And then chemical, I mean nutrients. And so nutrients are like nitrates and phosphates. Um, those are the things that we see in fertilizer that you use with crops. And so I'll focus a lot on this nutrient idea because it's something that affects a lot of us. Um, and then going back to this idea that I do work a lot in the Gulf of Mexico, you hear that the um, Gulf of Mexico dead zone is one of the largest in the world. Um, and that's because of this ex excess nutrient runoff. But to explain the situation with nutrients is, set the stage, you have a river. Um, and yes? Yes, good evening. That dead zone yes. is at the base of the Mississippi, right? Yes because of the nutrient, nutrient runoff from all the farming yes. going right up through the country. Yes. Um, and how big an area is that? It changes based on the year yeah. um, because of the amount of rainfall and the amount of um, nutrients that are being dumped in. It's also really dynamic, but it's, I can't give you an exact size, but it can range from like most of like Louisiana's like size. It's, it's very large. 
if you're in a ship and you're up on the mast or mm -hmm. the wheelhouse, you can actually see the coloration or decoloration of the water. You, you could actually see the dead zone. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's really interesting <clears throat> at these how some of these are bottom-up effects that are anthropogenically introduced. Um, so to explain some of this idea is we have these farms around, say trees, and they have the nutrients that are at, like put into the water. And they go down, and now they're in the ocean. A big problem, though, is when we have a lot of rainfall, you get a lot of nutrients dumped in there. So say a hurricane, you have a lot of rainfall, you have lots of nutrients dumped in, and those phytoplankton love the nutrients. If you put a, a ton of nutrients in the water, the phytoplankton are gonna respond equally. It's like they'll keep growing and equally in response to nutrients. It's an interesting dynamic. So now remember those phytoplankton are on the base of our, um, our food web, going back to our food web. And so we've increased the phytoplankton biomass, but we, the response on the upper levels is, isn't always as equal as you would think because it really depends on the duration and the frequency of those nutrients. Because if you put a ton in, then you have a lot of bacteria that are eating the um, phytoplankton as they die, and everything respires. So everything will take O2, make CO2, right? And so, if you're using all of that oxygen from your bacteria, then you can't, the fish don't have that oxygen. So that creates the dead zones. Um, so it's, it's sometimes hard to predict, but it really depends on frequency and duration. So if it's a pulse event really fast, we're gonna throw some nutrients in there, and then they're gonna have a phytoplankton party for like a day, and then they die off, like it doesn't have the dead zone effect. Um, so to really bring this all home, I wanted to give you guys a case study. So I know I talked to you about Hurricane Katrina earlier, but my question is, what if another Hurricane Katrina-like storm hit the Gulf of Mexico? It would be devastating, and we know that. We saw something very similar last week with Hurricane Ian. Um, but this is a study that I used, ecosystem-based modeling, and I looked at the Gulf of Mexico. So we're up here. This is the Gulf of Mexico. and um, Gulf is home to lots of hurricanes. This is just our 2020 tracks. And um, when, with hurricanes comes both reduced fishing, which is you know, a top-down control like we talked about, also nutrient pulses and a bottom-up control. Just a fun fact, this is a picture from my apartment from Hurricane Irma. <laughs> so, I mean, when you have a lot of rain, you have these pulses and they're becoming more frequent. The hurricanes are becoming more intense. The rain is just becoming more intense. So it, it's all about ecology and how everything's gonna interact. So remember that giant food web that I talked to you about before? <laughs> um, this is the one I, that I use for this and it's just of the Gulf of Mexico continental shelf. We're not gonna talk about all of this because that's way too much. We're gonna focus on these four groups, the phytoplankton, the shrimp, the menhaden, and the grouper. And I picked these species out because they're trophically related. One thing eats the other thing and they all scale up and down. Um, so my big question was, is the ecosystem response to a hurricane top, top down dominated or bottom up dominated? So top down meaning dominated by that reduced fishing or is it dominated by the nutrient pulse? So that's a really broad question, and if you're a statistician like me, you're like, well, that's really cool, but how do I do that numerically? How do I produce some results? So I kind of, what was asked was, when you consider these effects, when you consider top-down or just using reduced fishing, and then just having a nutrient pulse, which one is more correlated when you have them together? Does that make sense? Okay. So. I'm gonna give you some numbers real fast, but basically what this is saying is when I compared, looked at the correlation between combined fishing and, or sorry, combined and reduced fishing, and then the combined effects and the nutrient pulse, combined and nutrient, sorry, combined and reduced fishing had significant results and also high correlations. 
whereas this nutrient pulse didn't have significant correlations, and so you don't really look at the correlation. This one is marginally significant if we're using an alpha value of 0.5. So a nice rule of thumb I like to use is if the P is high, the null must fly with statistics. So the P value is 0.49-ish. It's right on the borderline of 0.5. So it's one of those that you, you could say it's significant, but we're gonna be you know, cautious with it, conservative with it, and tread lightly and not really delve into what that means. Um, but we could if we had more, more data that supported it. Um, so again, this is basically what we're asking, which one is dominant? And what these results say is reduced fishing has a more dominant impact for all four species that I looked at. But again, that reduced fishing had a really long recovery time. So these are, just to set the stage, in the simulation model, I ran it for 100 years. This is just 60 years shown. And then the, you got four plots. Each species is a plot. Your x-axis is year in the simulation. Your y-axis is the biomass, okay? And then these black lines is when the hurricane were to hit. Um, so reduced fishing is in red. Gray is if a nutrient pulse. And these are our individual effects. Our control is yellow, and the combined is if you run them together. So it's really interesting for a lot of reasons. One, it takes about 45 years for all of these species to reach its initial state. So what does that mean if we have another hurricane about like right here? I, I mean, we can run simulations and look at that, but what does that mean for like our fishermen and our communities and our e ecology? Um, another thing is this longer duration really makes it so that the reduced fishing has a longer impact than the nutrient pulse and a more dominant impact. Um, but they're really both important to consider because you can see this nutrient pulse on this side has a really big impact because a lot of or, you know, our species are eating that phytoplankton. And again, each species has a different result because of their ecology, because of how they're interacting with their environment and with other species. And then, like I said before, the frequency and severity of storms, that's a really scary idea because it's expected to increase. So what happens if we keep having these? Will our fish ever, <coughs> our communities ever be able to make, reach like a equilibrium state again? or what will become its equilibrium state. Um, so why does this matter to you guys? I mean, this is the Gulf of Mexico. It's doom and gloom there, but things might be good here. Um, you know how we've talked about bluefin tuna a bunch? Um, fun fact, they spawn in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we have teleconnections that connect you and me. Um, and so we all have to come at this as like a combined approach. Uh, it's, it's an interesting situation to be in. We can all work together and learn about our systems. Um, ecology, so ecology connects us all, it's that interaction. And these ecosystem models are really great because they allow us to consider these interactions. Um, so with that, I would like to take any questions. Um, I'm happy to elaborate more on any of this, but yeah. yes. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Curious if you could go back to the slide Yes. So are you saying it took, in your model, it took 45 years for those four species to return to pre-hurricane yep. status? Yeah. And from the time the hurricane happened to that 45 years, when do you reintroduce fishing into the... So fishing is actually reintroduced right after the hurricane. And it's reintroduced at a uh, increased rate of like, I, I can't remember the number off the top of my head. It's the same, um, same rebuilding rate that we saw after Hurricane Katrina. Uh -huh. um, and so it starts off with almost a zero fishing, it was 5% fishing because that storm knocked out 95% of the fishing industry. And then it was a slow recovery, I think of initially 3% per month, then it gained once it hit like a certain level. 
I can get those exact numbers to you if you want. Um, I'm but just curious. Um, so you, you're presenting the four species here, but your model was the whole. It included every. Oh man, where is this? It included all of these. So is that 45 years? Is that for those four species it's, or for the whole? It's for these four species and most of the others. But um, that's a. I can. I sh um, I can look more into it and find the ones that don't um, hit 45 years, but almost all of them did. There was a handful that did not. Were, that was sort of my follow-up. Were there any species in the model that rebounded rapidly, like took advantage of the chaos? I, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, I'll look at that because I think the ones that are lower, that aren't affected by fishing, um, but are highly, like if you increase microalgae, there's nothing really fishing for mullet. So, you know, you get a ton of mullet. Everyone, anyone have smoked mullet in here? It's a delicacy in Florida. Yes? Yeah, shellfish included are um, the new part of the sea can make sure is it all just fish or is there any um, shell of clams, uh, that kind of? So there's shrimp included. Um, this is a model that was built by someone who works in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I can go back and we can add species or take out species. <coughs> an interesting thing that they use in some of the, this is an ecosim, an eco, ecopathless ecosim model. And so an interesting thing they do with these models is they group species into like trophic groups. So if you look here, when we talked about grouper, we we're talking about three, ages three plus, but you can have younger grouper in a different group. Um, you can like, put together similar species that have similar trophic relationships and age and growth. This did include shrimp, but I don't, it did not include shellfish. Um, but the lobster fod is just the, the fishery. Oh, okay. So most of the things you see at the top are the fisheries. Yes. So based on your model, if we have a big hurricane every 45 years, we're okay. <laughs> I, so this is a Gulf of Mexico model. I don't, I, um, it'd be really cool if someone did this same thing for your area and maybe looked at the impact of Hurricane Sandy or like something <coughs> similar to Sandy. But my, the second part of that is we don't have big hurricanes mm -hmm. only every 45 years. Mm -hmm. We have them rather more frequently. Yes. So that starts the ecosystem rebuilding Possibly. Trying to get out of, that presents the fishermen with a really dynamic situation, doesn't it? It does. And so we go back to this idea of these like controls, right? Where it's not an easy ratio. It's not like, oh, you take one thing out and this is how it all responds. Ecology is difficult because of this. And it, it, exactly, if you have something hit before and it's still trying to reach steady state, basically is a potentially state of chaos. So it's really good for us to understand our ecosystems and have really solid data. Yes? Sorry to dominate, Tom. Fascinating. What's the trigger for the storm? What? Category two, category three, duration, I mean. Uh, for this storm, model? And then our storm. So this is modeling a category. This is saying Hurricane Katrina happens again somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a worst case scenario. Yeah, sorry. Um, but again, we're getting more and more of those Hurricane Katrina storms. And I think we were talking about earlier, if you look at the size of the storms that are hitting the Gulf, they're getting bigger. I mean, I'm looking, I'm thinking back, um, Hurricane Allison hit when I was young. And it was, I saw a picture of it the other day. And it looks tiny compared to Hurricane Harvey. By the way, I'm from Houston, so Hurricane Harvey got me and that one, really hit home just because you saw the flooding. And then we saw <coughs> impacts on our fisheries from the flooding <coughs> through the Galveston Bay later. So everything is connected. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I was just trying to <coughs> understand in, in the model anyways, is it sensitive to the size of the storm? Can you turn the yes. storm up and down? You can. You can control, basically <coughs> my controls on this were the amount of nutrients which stimulates phytoplankton, and then the 
recovery rate of the fisheries. And you could say, you know what, maybe the, the snook fishery, nothing <coughs> happened to it. So that one could continue as is. So you, there's a lot of knobs that you can control. I just took this as a wipeout. But it would be really interesting to say, like, there's a lot of money in this one fishery. Maybe they could rebuild faster. Yes? So your inner argument assumes a 95% loss of the fishing fleet? In, yeah, initially. So, and what happens when you don't lose 95%? We, you don't lose 95%? Yeah. Like, so down south, you know, there's not much relief yeah. to the land, so they, they, they suffer from more of a strong surge and will incur more losses mm -hmm. of fishing vessels. And yeah. Stuff here where we, we don't have that sort of problem. Yeah. Other problems, but um, what happens when you only lose, say, Uh, probably. I haven't run that simulation, um, but I would assume so, because you still get a huge nutrient pulse, right? right. But you, you just would have, down, right? exactly, your just consumers aren't as impacted. Mm -hmm. um, yes? It seems to me that in the New Orleans area, or the Louisiana area, they've had, over the last year, they've had multiple hurricanes. Yeah, I actually have a picture now, of that. How separate is this? In other words, you've got the Gulf of Mexico. Are mm -hmm. we talking about subsections of the Gulf that go through these things, or does, does it spread throughout the Gulf? So the way that ecosystem management works right now in the Gulf of Mexico is it considers the Gulf as one unit. So basically that model that you saw mm -hmm. is supposed to be a representation of all continental mm -hmm. shelf of the Gulf. But yeah, that, so my, my dissertation is, is like, oh, are we sure? Yeah. Um, so what my dissertation looks at in particular, this is a, like a fun side project that I did when I was bored on a Saturday night. <laughs> um, I kid you not, like this, these are my hobbies, guys. I, I really enjoy doing this. I'm, I'm real numbers and real, I wanna understand. And because I think it's important for us to understand what might happen so we can talk to our fishermen, so we can be prepared. Um, but my dissertation is also looking at basically how is the Gulf of Mexico fisheries responding to climate variables? So my first chapter is saying, is there climate, well, I mean, we know climate change is occurring, but is it occurring across the Gulf of Mexico equally? Or is it occurring at different rates in different places? And where are high priority areas? Because if it's not all high priority, Maybe we don't focus on the low, like on the places it's not really rapid. We're not seeing huge changes in temperature and dissolved oxygen. Let's focus on the places that really need it. And then like what the next chapter, like, okay, we have this real problem in the Gulf of Mexico where basically we're seeing a lot of sea level rise and it's flooding out our salt marshes. And so our salt marshes are drowning and also we have mangroves coming in. And so we have habitat replacement. And some fish thrive in the salt marshes and do not do well in the mangroves. So are we seeing a die out of those salt marsh like fish? So are we seeing, going back to that habitat interactions, what does that mean? So, and then also I'm looking at um, coral reefs and like basically the same thing there. Yes? Hi, I'm curious, uh, <coughs> the great red snapper project, how do you count the fish in <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing question. Um, so I, just to put it in perspective, I was a starting master's student, actually finishing undergrad student. I was interviewing for a position as a master's student to work on this project. And my advisor, who ended up hiring me, said, so we want to do this project. We're going to count all the red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. And I was like, OK, OK. And I went home and I Googled, how do you how do, you do that? Um, but basically, you. In the Gulf of Mexico, it's characterized by habitat a lot, where 2% of our habitat in the Gulf is uh, like fish habitat, good for fish, meaning that it's coral reef or it's artificial structure, it's an oil rig, something like that where fish can grow. Because not, not, red snapper don't love like nothing there. We found out that they actually do really enjoy that, but initially we were thinking like red snapper really aren't on the sand, which makes up 92% of the Gulf of Mexico habitat. So what we did was we split it into parts 
and the Gulf of Mexico into parts. We had a team in Texas, Louisiana, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. And then each group surveyed their respective habitat with different methods. So I used ROVs, so remotely operated vehicles. And um, if you don't know what that is, it's like a giant robot that's very <clears> expensive <throat> and you drive it around like a video game. So anyone who said, or told a child, you won't be successful if you, all you do is play video games. I never played video games as a kid, and that actually really messed me up when I first started driving the ROV. Um, but you drive it, and you get this full video of what's going on, and you can count every red snapper and every species you see down there and you know, get an idea. And uh, does everyone in here know what a fish finder is on a boat? So you, you can use black magic and basically pull out abundance estimates from that. You can say there's this many fish or this, this many pounds of fish based on the size length ratios and the backscatter. And so from that video data that you watched and you say, okay, 30% of this place is red snapper and there's 500 fish here. 30% of 500 is now my estimate for this site. And then you, get an, you basically extrapolate from there based on your habitat and your um, depth zonation. So huge project. It was a 21 um, principal investigator project from 12 universities. And my master's advisor was the lead PI on it. So it was one of the best experiences. Um, but yeah. Yes? I'm just going to the last question and then move on. So I'm just still struggling with the 45 years. OK. Because it keeps talking about Hurricane Katrina, but we know that didn't occur 45 years ago. Yeah, so it's still recovering potentially. Okay, so like we haven't reached, it might still, yeah. So okay. that's, the, that's the interesting part of this is this is a model simulation. And so you, it's really nice when you have historical data that goes 45 years from Hurricane Katrina so we can basically <clears throat> look at your model and say, is this correct? Um, so in 35 years, I will reach out to you, all of you guys. Um, but yeah, it, it is a struggle sometimes. You're like, but are we back there? And the answer is we're still finding out because that fishery is still recovering because it did lose. Think about everyone who left Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. I mean, I remember I was in grade school and my class was doubled in size because I was in Houston. Like, and they stayed because you know who wants to move your family all over the country all the time. So I mean that they're still recovering. Does that help? Okay. Um, here's my. Oh, let me get one last. I'm gonna put. Yes. Yes. It is very controversial. It does. I think, they, I think they're still at odds a little bit. Um, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. So the thing is, everyone thought, sorry, I know Rachel. Um, so the th thing is, nobody really thought red snapper were going to be on, on unconsolidated sand mud bottom, right? That makes up 92% of the Gulf of Mexico. But when we would survey these areas, we'd see one or two or three or a few red snapper. but because it made up, so since that amount of habitat made up that much area, it had a really big impact on the extrapolation. So I don't really know where it's at now. I, um, I graduated, I finished my master's in December 2020, um, right when it was going to NOAA to be reviewed. So I, I honestly am not very sure where that, the state of that is now. But they're doing a great amberjack count, in case you're curious. A great amberjack count. <laughs> so um, here is my email, though, at the bottom, jillt at usf.edu. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. I am here and love to talk with you all later, too. Thank you all. have another session of Q&A at the end as well, um, so we'll be able to keep asking Jill questions as well. I know <laughs> that was an incredible presentation, right, and, and so much to dive into, and 
really appreciated how you broke down these, these big topics and something happening so far away and made it relevant and interesting to all of us here. Um, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, and now we have another wonderful speaker. So we're really excited to have Dr. Dave Wiley with us today. Um, See, I've got get in, while you get all set up, I'm going to introduce you. So I had um, the amazing pleasure of, of meeting uh, Dr. Dave Wiley this summer as well. Um, I was actually first introduced to his work because John sent me his paper on sand lances, um, essentially saying we have to get this guy in for our speaker series, which we're glad it's finally happening. Um, but I, I, you know, went through his paper on sand lances and then I got connected with him and I was told, oh, we should get on a boat with him and go tag seabirds with him. And I'm like, okay, sand lances, seabirds, okay, okay, we're going. <laughs> They're all the um, same. And I, I show up um, to get on the boat, which I, I thought was going to tag uh, seabirds actually, and then it turns out it was the whale tagging crew actually. And I was like, okay, wait, <laughs> what is happening here? And at, at the end, the trip was absolutely incredible. I get off, I'm like, Dave, what do you do? Because uh, there's sand lances, there's seabirds, there's whales. All of these seem very different. <laughs> a lot of very different uh, techniques you would use to study them. And um, what I got from the conversation was essentially a, a little bit of everything. He studies the ecosystems, how everything connects and works together, uh, which is just absolutely incredible to study, right? And that's why he's uh, with us today. Um, and if you'll, you'll let me, I want to read your bio because it was just astounding to read everything that, that he's accomplished up till now, um, <laughs> including, uh, <laughs> but not limited to this I event, of course. I am paying her for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, but Dr. David Wiley is a research ecologist for NOAA's Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Um, he received his PhD in environmental studies, conservation biology from Antioch University. He has worked with fishermen to redesign fishing gear to reduce the risk of whale entanglement and pioneered methods to successfully rescue mass-stranded whales and dolphins. On Cape Cod. Yeah. <laughs> Currently, he leads research using advanced telemetry and visualization software to explore the underwater behavior of endangered whales, satellite telemetry to understand the movements and foraging ecology of seabirds, and the ecology and climate impacts of sand lance forage fish. Yay, sand lance. Yeah. <laughs> Um, his results have appeared in scientific journals ranging from animal behavior to conservation biology. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including a Switzer Environmental Leadership Award, Gulf of Maine Visionary Award, NextGov Bold Award for Scientific Innovation, the Society for Marine Mammalogies Award for Excellence in Scientific Communication, which we're going to experience today, um, and an Ian Science, oh, which is that? Ian Oxford Fulbright Award. My apologies. He has been recognized as NOE's Employee of the Year for Science and awarded the U.S. Department of Commerce Gold Medal for Scientific Leadership. He is adjunct faculty in the College of Science and Mathematics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, affiliate faculty in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Oregon State University, and a guest investigator at Woods Hole Oceanography. Oceanographic Institution. Um, and if that's not enough, he's here with us today. So uh, please give it up. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, tripped it down. I, I could just leave, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, All right, but Dave, please yeah. take it away. We're so excited to have you. Yeah, that was a lot. Thanks. Um, I always look for that person after somebody does that. So it, it's great to be here. I, I think this is a, such a great organization. You know, the way John has, has put this all together, uh, it's really one of the the premier organizations, as far as I'm concerned, trying to look at fisheries from an ecosystem-based uh, condition. So not many people do that, so I really um, thank you guys. And we're working on a couple projects together for Sandlands, which I, I really appreciate their help on. Um, so um, again, this is a treat for me to be here talking to you guys because you're all supporters of this organization. And, and like Jill, if I hear my own voice for too long a period of time, I, I go to sleep. So, you know, so put your hands up. A discussion is way more fun than, uh, than me just droning on and on and on. But I do like droning on and on about sand lands, as, as people will tell you. They're, they're, you know, although I, I work with whales and seabirds, um, really my, my favorite thing is sand lands, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll see why, because basically everything else depends on them. So here we are there, and I call this the nutrition at the right size, shape, and number because there are these neat little fish. Let me just not jump ahead of myself. That are about this long, um, about as big around as your thumb, maybe a little bit bigger. And they call them sand lance because they live in the sand. So you can see them. They're just diving in and out of the sand. They're really crazy, crazy things. Amidites, which is their scientific name, means sand diver. So you can see they just they dive in and out at full speed. So they're crazy, crazy fish. Um, and because of that, um, you know, they're really pretty safe. So there's lots of them around. But because there's lots of them around, everybody likes to eat them. 
So you'll see as I uh, go along this talk, um, they really form the basis of a lot of the food web for the things that Jill is talking about for the southern Gulf of Maine. Sandlands really are, are hugely important. So this just says that they're important. <laughs> Okay, so key points of that. Okay, first of all, sandlands require sand of a particular type. You saw them just diving in and out of that, right? If it was too muddy, they just bong and, and knock themselves out. Um, if it's too thick, then the same thing. They can't really get in it. So it has to be a particular grain size so when they go in the sand, they can get in, in and out of it quickly. But also, they spend a lot of time in the sand. And so there's got to be enough space between those sand grains that they can have oxygen in there so they don't die once they go in. So there's a particular grain size that they have to have, which we're really lucky stretching from, you know, from the area off Chatham up through Stillwagon Bank is all sand of that size. So this is the perfect place for sandlands. And they also like a particular depth. So between 20 and, and 80 meters is probably their favorite depth. So the, the water depth around here, the sand size around here, it's all perfect for sandlands. So we'll see how important they are for around here. And as I have there in red, everything eats them. Um, and they're extremely place-based. Because they have to have sand of a particular type, you know, that sand isn't everywhere. So they're in particular places. So they're not found everywhere. They're found in particular spots where they have that nice sand. And they're really hard to monitor. Jill is talking about counting those fish, right? Well, it's really hard to count these fish because they don't have swim bladders. So when you use your echo sounder, they really don't show up the way that other fish will. So you can't say, here's, here's one, here's one, here's one. Um, they, they, you can get this huge mass that will just make your echo sounder go black because there's so many of them, but you can't pick out individuals because they don't have any swim bladders. And because of that nice, thin, eel-like shape, they're not eels, by the way, um, although people call them eels because of that shape. They're, they're regular fish. Um, but they, can, they don't stay in nets very well. So most of the time when uh, fishing biologists or fisheries biologists are trying to figure out how many fish are out there, you know, they either use echo sounders or they use nets. So both of these things are really bad when you're trying to count sand lands. So nobody knows how many are out there. It's just a, a total, total crapshoot. So things that we do know about them. When we started our project on sand lands about uh, almost 10 years ago now, almost nothing was known about them. And now we know a fair amount about them, but still not enough. But one thing we found out for our area on Stillwagon, and most of this research that I'm going to talk about is, uh, take, took place in the Stillwagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Most of you guys know where that is, right? It's between uh, Provincetown and, and Gloucester, um, you know, a couple miles offshore. So it's a big sand bank, basically, is what it is, which is why it's so great for sandlands. And that's why it's so great for everything else, as you'll see in this story. But we, first, people used to think that they had this prolonged um, spawning period that went on for most of the winter. And so we went out, and we were trawling for them, and we'd catch them, and then we'd look at them and see, are they ready to spawn or not? And you can actually squeeze them, and if there's, they're a male, little sperm will come out, and if they're females, little eggs will come out, so you know, um, you know, are they ready to spawn or not? So when we looked at this, we found that we went out in, on, no, in this case, the beginning of, of November, of November 9th, and their reproductive conditions, their gonads, weren't very well developed. And see, here's, they're only up to this portion. We went out a week later on the 22nd or two weeks later, and their gonad situation was really ripe. So they were ready to spawn. Just a week later, they were gone. So they spawned in a very, very short period of time. So that becomes important in terms of disturbance. So if you disturb them during that period of time, then not, they're not going to be reproducing terribly well. Oh, and also, um, the eggs are going to be sitting on the bottom for about six weeks. And after that, they hatch. And they become these little larval things um, that actually drift around for almost three months. So they're really crazy. So once they get into that water column, then they start drifting around for months, wherever the water column take or wherever the currents take them. So does anything eat the eggs? Is there a That's a really good that? question. Probably we haven't recorded anything eating their eggs. You know, so uh, we also use ROVs to, to go down and look, and we see them eating like juvenile um, sand lance, but we've never seen anybody grazing on the eggs. But I'm sure everything eats something, right? So I would sure that, I'm sure that something's eating them. So this is what, what they look like when they start hatching out. So they've, they've hatched out. Now they've become real fish. 
They've stopped being, you know, these little larval things. So they stop being that, and they're becoming regular fish. And they'll start eating copepods. These are copepods up here. Copepods are things about the size of a period at the end of the sentence, or what right whales also eat. Basically, everything out there eats copepods. So sand lance are, are no exception to that. And they start eating them really in February. And so they come out, and they start eating them in February, and they eat and eat and eat until about July. And they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger until about July. And they're getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And after July, they just stop eating. And they actually go down into the sand and just sit there until they spawn in November. It's kind of crazy. And then they have no lipid content at all. And so they, they have to stay there in the sand. And if they get disturbed then, uh, they don't have a lot of energy to, to, um, to, ex to figure out how to deal with that extra energy that they're being disturbed from. So this is a problem for them. So all of their growth, all their lipid content is in this quick period between um, February right up to July. Then they stop eating up until the next February. Keeping, that'll become important to the next part of our story. And now you can look at ear bones in fish. Okay? What's really cool about fish is that like rings on a tree, their ear bones have rings. So you can actually count how old a fish is by looking at these ear bones and counting up the rings in their ear bones. Really crazy, but really important in fisheries biology. So we can look at, those are ear bones on the, on the middle panel. You can see three different ear bones. And you can count out how low those fish are. And when we do that, um, they don't live very long. Most of them are, are the first year of their lives, second year, or third year. You don't find anything living much more than three years. So they're, they're a fast living fish. And now we're not really sure if that's because everything eats them or they're really not able to live for other reasons. They've been kept in captivity for up to seven years, so they can live more than, more than four years, but it seems like probably they just get eaten so fast that they just, um, you know, after four years, you're, you're done for. Now, we, we had a uh, workshop that I put together a couple of people uh, about seven years ago now, and out of that, we came with this, this major scientific publication where we looked at how many things are eating sand lance. And I've been saying everything eats them. And this kind of shows you what. Um, 72 different predators, 45 species of fish, 16 seabirds, and nine marine mammals um, eat sand lance. So that's a lot of different things. So if you're wondering why they don't live more than four years, um, it's probably why. And important to commercial fisheries, you know, sand and sand habitats are really important because they go together. Sand lance, sand habitats. So how important is that for commercial fisheries? We looked at the Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary, and we can look at a bunch of data that we get from the National Marine Fisheries Service as to where different types of fish are caught and how much that's worth. So if you look at this pie chart, most of the pounds and most of the dollar value is coming from sand habitat. So here you're seeing 46% of the of the catch of the pounds land that are coming from sand. And again, about 44% of the value, the dollar value, is coming from sand habitat. And most of that is because of sand lands. So if we look, this is uh, some information, again, looking at the types of food that different species of fish are eating. So these are the different uh, species of fish up here. Spiny dogfish, number one sand lance. Winter skate, number one sand lance. Little skate, number one sand lance. <laughs> Atlanta cod, number one sand lance. Yellow flounder, number four sand lance. So you can see how important sand lance are to all these different commercial fish species. And if we look at, this is um, called the global index of co-location. So you do s some math like, like Jill is talking about, and you, what you want to look at is, are sand lance and different fish found in the same places? So in this particular instance, uh, we are working with Kevin Stokesbury. So he has a, an open trawl end for his, his trawls. So it doesn't kill the fish. So you just watch them go through the videotape. And so then you can look at how many sand lance and how many flatfish are found in the same area. How many sand lance and how many cod are found in the same area. And you do this math, and zero ranges from zero to one. Zero means they're not associated at all. One means they, they're right on top of each other. And so if you look here, the co-location for a lot of these is 0 0.9, 0 um, 0.8. So they're really, so, so sand lance and these different fish species are co-located. They're being found together at the same time. Makes sense, because they're eating them. So that was fish. How about whales and seabirds? So 
you know, lots of times you, when you go out to look for whales and seabirds, you look for the birds and you find the whales, so they're together. But why are they together? So we're looking at sand habitat first. So in the Still Wagon Sanctuary, we've got these great maps. We use multi-beam um, equipment to map the bottom so we can tell what's sand, what's gravel, what's mud, and we have these great maps. So we can then put all these data over these maps to figure out what kind of habitat different species are, are living in. So here we're looking at, we gridded, we did these tracks through the sanctuary. These are tracks on our research boat, and we're counting birds as we do that. And then we took the sanctuary and we gridded cells along those track lines, and we said, how much sand is in that cell? So here you can see 10%, 20%, 30%. And if the line is going down, it means the bird species are underrepresented in that cell. If the line is going up, those bars are going up, it means the birds are overrepresented. So if you look down here, they're overrepresented in high sand. So better than 60% sand, that's where we're finding all of our birds. Why would that be? Anybody have an idea? <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you're right. <laughs> okay, so one of the things we do is we catch the sand, the birds. Here we are. So these are great shearwaters. So we attract them to the boat, and our, our good friend down there on the bottom picture, Ray Kane, taught us how to catch these birds actually better. Um, and then we catch them, we weigh them, we do all sorts of stuff, we have them breathe into little masks so we can figure out stable isope analysis, what they're eating. And then we let them go fly around, and then they tell us where they're going. And then we take all those data, and we figure out where, really where are they hanging out. Oh, there's one with his little backpack satellite transmitter on him. And then we take all those data, and we look at where the birds are spending most of their time. And they're spending most of their time over sand habitat. Uh, as a matter of fact, with the, one of the great spots, two of the best spots, one right here off Chatham and one up here on Stellwagen Bank. So two of the best sand places around uh, and also the best sandlands habitat around. And then we, we ha put them in these little cages and we wait for them to go to the bathroom and then we collect that. It's very fun. <laughs> and then we do DNA analysis on it to see what they've been eating. And if you look there at the top thing, the ma major thing that they eat is amidites, which is sand lance. And I talked about the co-occurrence uh, model before. Uh, so zero to one, uh, zero being no association, one being total association, and sand lance and shearwaters are here at 0.946, so 0.95. So again, high correlation, uh, index of co-location for sand lance and great shearwaters. Yeah. So are they eating off the fishing boats? That, that's my guess for some of those. Some of those really crazy ones at low levels are probably um, because they're scavenging off fishing boats. The reason we catch, we work on these birds is because we can catch them. Everybody goes, why are you just doing great sand or uh, great shearwaters? And it's because we can actually catch them. And we catch them because we throw stuff into the water and they'll come to eat that and then we get them with the nets. Other species, um, like Cory shearwaters and Sooty shearwaters, they won't come to the, uh, to the bait, um, so we don't really catch those guys. We, we are catching them now. We have to go out at night and jack light them, so that's very fun. So you go out at night, and uh, you, know, you've, you've, you use night scopes to find them sitting on the water, and then you have a big, flat, a big spotlight, and then they get really confused, and then you can scoop them up, but, but they don't come to bait. It's, it's, it's not fair, but it's very fun. <laughs> it's one of my favorites, actually. <laughs> so this, this is, again, looking at, at this co-location idea. And what we're doing here is looking at where sand lance and whales and, uh, and humpbacks are found, and also seabirds. So we have the, I uh, won't get into the whole design, but basically it's showing that here you have our data say there's a lot of sand lance down here in the southern part of the Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary. And at the same time, we're counting whales and, and birds. And in the same places we find the sand lance, we find the whales 
and we find the birds. So again, that, that's the idea of that, that co-location. So sand lands and sand habitats are really important because they're really part of the most productive parts of the southern Gulf of Maine, um, and both for fish and for birds and, and for whales. So what, what's going to happen here? So Gulf of Maine is really interesting because it's warming faster than most any place in the ocean. Um, so that's a, a real interest and a real concern, um, I think. Yeah, well, they have ideas. The, the bottom currents are, are, and it's really bottom currents more than surface currents. So the, the, the Labrador current and the uh, Gulf of Mexico current are changing. So we're being more influenced by the Gulf of Mexico warm water now, where we used to be more influenced by the Labrador current with cold water. So that's a simplistic explanation. So, so what's that going to mean for sandlands? So remember when I said talk about sandlands, with their, they feed in February, you know, they, they're sitting down there, they're not eating anything after they spawn, and they're not, but they're using up their energy reserves. So if the water is warmer, their metabolism is higher. So they're using up those energy reserves while they're sta sitting there in that sand, and unless they can immediately come out and feed, well, then they're gonna starve to death. So what's happening with copepods, with they, which is their main food, is copepods are moving north. They don't like warm water. So copepods are moving north, so sand lance can't move. So the sand lance here um, have a tendency, if it keeps on going, um, the adults will starve to death. Now, we also looked at um, sand lance, larval sand lance, baby sand lance. And the way we did this is we took our trawl nets in our, our research boat and we caught sand lance during that time that I told you they were spawning during that brief one week, two week window. And we brought them back to the University of Connecticut. Hannes Bauman is one of our, our partners on this. And he raised them in different uh, tanks under different conditions of, of uh, ocean acidification, PCO2, and water temperatures. And he found out that under high con I won't go over the math here. Um, under high conditions of, of ocean acidification and temperatures, the larval survival dropped dramatically. So here you can see it's dropping from 34% um, down to 2%, from 16% to 1%. These are different um, metrics of ocean acidification, okay, microatmospheres, and these are different temperatures. So as the temperatures go up and the ocean acidification goes up, um, the ability of the, the reproductive success, the ability of these larval sand lands to survive goes down dramatically. So what do we found out? High co-location among sand lance and top predators, really important. Sand lance are extremely sensitive uh, to ocean acidification, one of the most sensitive that we've tested to date, uh, according to Hannes. I don't really do that testing. And there's a synergistic effect with, with water temperature. So that it's really sensitive to PCO2, to ocean acidification, but if you increase the water temperature, it gets even worse. They're dependent on calinus, and if calinus are moving north and are here to, to um, uh, to provision them, particularly in the times they need it, when they come out of this estivation stage, um, then the adults aren't, are going to die directly. So those are real, real concerns. Okay, now there, there's other issues in addition to climate change. Um, sand habitat is really being looked at for mining uh, to armor the shoreline. And if you do that, um, of course, you're taking that habitat away from sand lands. Uh, wind energy, wind energy, th these nice um, areas of sand that are in fairly shallow waters are really perfect places for wind energy. Um, so they're vulnerable to, um, to be exploited for wind energy as well. Um, now, we're lucky in, in the sanctuary because some of the prohibitions that we have, you can't mine sand in the sanctuary. You can't build things uh, like windmills in the sanctuary. Um, you could off the coast of Chatham here. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, and also commercial fisheries. The biggest commercial fishery, one of the biggest commercial fisheries is for sand lance in the North Sea. So there isn't a commercial fishery here, um, but there could be. Um, and again, it's the biggest commercial fishery in the North Sea. Um, we've been working with Ray and, and John um, and been very successful working with the state of Massachusetts. The state of Massachusetts has now banned the possession or the landing of more than 200 pounds of sand lance um, at a, on a day by a person. And that's really designed to keep a commercial fishery from occurring. 
And we, once Massachusetts did that, we worked with the state of Rhode Island, so they've also implemented the same ban. And now the state of Connecticut has also implemented the same ban. Um, so, and we're now working with the states of New York and, and um, New Jersey to try to do the same thing. So, so what is the commercial use of the sand? Of the sand or the sand lands? It's, it's an industrial fishery ground up for fish meal, uh, yeah. mink farms, things like that. Yeah, it's yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, I, a, a person sent me a, a picture the other day. She was at her dog, dog walking place, and they had sand lance in a jar that you could give to your dog, you know, little dried sand lance. Yeah. And, and you know, they have sand lance, um, sand lance sauce. You know, you can go to, like, some of the, some of the supermarkets uh, and find sand lance sauce and stuff like fish sauce. So, but mostly it's, it's an industrial fishery ground up for fish meal. Yeah. Somebody else? Wait, wait, I haven't got to my question slide. There you go, questions. Now you can ask questions. John. Yeah, good question. The response we keep getting is we don't have a lot of information. We know they're there, we know they play a role, but we don't know how to model them. Right. And the idea that copepods are moving on and that the role of sand lance is going to decline, or the presence of sand lance is going to decline in ecosystems is starting to be. I wonder um, what will fill its place. Right. That is, a, that is a great question. So as a matter of fact, th this is a paper that we have uh, that came out that was looking at historically, sand lance and herring have almost been in opposition with. So if sand lance are high, herring are low. If herring are li high, sand lance are low. So there's always been a lipid rich fish um, to support the Gulf Maine fishery. Um, in the future, it looks like that is not gonna happen. Both of these fish are gonna be gone. So that's a real concern. And what will take its place, butterfish? certainly could move north. Um, they're not quite as uh, lipid rich as some of the others. It's really bad for seabirds um, because you know, the nice thing about sand lance is they're like spaghetti, right? So you can take a big sand lance and put it into a little seabird chick and they can swallow it right down. Butterfish are like, almost like little squares. So there's all these horrible pictures of, of baby um, chicks starving with butterfish all around them because it's the only thing that parents can find and they, the chicks just can't swallow them. So they're dying even though the parents are working as hard as they can to feed them. So sometimes when these things change, you're right, so it, nature doesn't leave an empty spot, but that empty spot may not be filling the niche that the other things did. So it could be, there'll, there'll be a fish there. It's like black sea bass are moving up here. Um, uh, so again, it's not like there won't be fish here, but they won't be doing the same things that, and serving the same roles that the ones that we have now are. And we kind of like things the way they are. And uh, this is kind of out of your realm, but just curious about the, only, the few things I know about birds is that they would like pre-eat the food for their babies. So I'm curious about that. But yeah. thirsty birds just wouldn't do that? No, oh, no. Okay. Um, and I can't think of any birds that really pre-chew their food because birds don't chew. Oh, and, like I thought there was a thing where they would like... Yeah, yeah, oh, they'll yeah. regurgitate stuff, yeah. yeah. And they wouldn't be able to do that yeah. to, to allow them to eat the... Yeah, no, they, they, these guys don't um, digest it and then regurgitate, okay. like penguins yeah. will and stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. no, the, these good. you know, it's, it's you eat it whole or you don't. Okay. Yeah, good question, yeah. So yes. Yep. Sand yep. Sand, sand, there will be sand lance in Canada. There just won't be sand lance here. There used to be a lot of sand lance in the Mid Atlantic. Um, there really aren't sand lance in the Mid Atlantic anymore. Gary. Yeah, hey, isn't it true you have things other than the environment working against the sand lance? Like I'm going to bring up one specific mammal, the seal. Uh, Sarah Coates was telling you. 
is Sandlands, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's, that's a huge problem because you know, years ago when there were more and more seals than there were now, there were more Sandlands than there were, are now. So you, know, you, you, you can't draw that one-to-one -one co co correspondence like you were saying. You know, it's a whole web. So certainly, you know, most of the f things that they eat are sand lance. There's no doubt about it. So they're not eating so much cod. Um, they're eating sand lance. And as a matter of fact, I used to have, you know, this could be a much longer talk. But if the, one of my friends was tagging gray seals around here, and they would go at night, and they would really go right into the sand lance areas. Uh, and you can just see they were staying. They, they, actually, their, their interpretation first when they're showing it to me was this is how far they could go and then they had to get back in the day before the white sharks would eat them. So that, that was his, his response. And I'm going, no, 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 that's not it. They're going out to where the sand is, <laughs> and then they're coming back. But um, you know, and maybe they're doing that in a time that they're not trying to get eaten by white sharks, which would make sense. But, um, but that was really what they were doing, is they were going out to forage in sand lands. And what's really cool about sand lands, too, and gray seals, is that you know, when, when, you have, when sand lands are in the substrate, if you put an ROV going past them, they all come flying out. Now, how stupid is that, right? <laughs> you went from being safe to, to being eat me. But it turns out the way gray seals eat sand lands is they bite the sand, they swallow the sand, and then they regurgitate it, and then they eat the sand lance that was in the sand. So if something big is coming at you, you'd better get out of the sand because that's actually safer than staying in the sand. So uh, all these cool little, little interactions that occur. But I don't, I don't think gray seals are inhibiting uh, the sand lance population um, any more than, than humpback whales are or you know, shearwaters are. Right off, right off Chatham is even better than, than, than um, Stellwagen for Sandlands. And this is a great fishery off Chatham. Right. Basically, everybody's following the Sandlands, so. Yeah. Yep, yep. You are where you eat, right? Yeah. So. Okay, well, thank you. That was fun. Thank you.